Hey everyone, it's Phil Hall of Westfair Communications. Thank you for joining us on today's episode and what an episode and what a guest. Have you ever heard of Take Your Daughters to Work Day? My guest created it, Nell Merlino, and she is now reigniting another one of her endeavors called Count Me In. And this is, first of all, I, I want to get this out of the way and I'm sorry if I sound like a fanboy, but how did you come up with the idea of Take Your Daughter to Work Day? I came up with that idea at my father's retirement dinner from public service. So it was inspired by what I'd learned going to work with my father, who was a very um, 20th century, wonderful politician and lawyer. So I, I learned an enormous amount going to work with him. And I also was very aware of what my mother did because my mother was a painter and she did that at home and also raised five children. So she had a lot of jobs. Wow. Well, what an impact you've made, and you've had a career of social entrepreneurship and empowering women in the business world. And now uh, we have Count Me In, which actually started uh, about 20 years ago. For the benefit yes. of the viewers who don't know what Count Me In is, what is this all about? Uh, Count Me In for Women's Economic Independence was founded in 2000, and we were the first online micro lender anywhere in the world and were dedicated to making sure that women had access to uh, capital and coaching and marketing. And we created a community of women business owners to help women grow micro businesses to million dollar companies. And Calmian is now uh, being reignited. Uh, what is the new version 2.0 of Calmian? Well, uh, you know, about ooh, seven, eight weeks ago, a former funder of Count Me In's, because it had sort of been in hiatus for a number of years, because I went off to do some new projects. And she said, do, do you want to revive Count Me In? And so we called it the Count Me In Revival. And uh, she, her name is Ariella Eskenazi. She runs an extraordinary, uh, huge lingerie company. She's one of the largest lingerie manufacturers in the world. And she gave us a quarter million dollars to give to women business owners. Uh, the name of her brand is Smart and Sexy, and she really is smart and sexy. And she um, encouraged me to, to, to revive the organization. And we, in six weeks, uh, got the whole thing sort of out of mothballs and did a um, grant competition, which closed yesterday. And we have over 400 completed applications from women across the country who will demonstrate in their applications, and we have a whole team of people that started to review them, uh, how they are handling the impact of the pandemic, as well as the protests in the sense of how are they reaching out to uh, people in their communities to change how they're doing business, to respond to the needs of everyone in their community, including obviously Black Lives Matter. You know, listening to this, I was reminded of something that I heard over the weekend. I had visited my mother, uh, who raised me as a single parent, and she had said back in 1970, 1971, when uh, she was applying for a lease for an apartment, her father, my grandfather, actually had to co-sign the lease. And yes. we recounted how difficult it was to, to get credit cards as a, uh, as a single parent. And that was a half century ago. But here we are in 2020, and uh, financial equality between the genders is uh, still elusive. How come after 50 years, we, we've made some progress, but not enough progress? What we are seeing at this moment is, and, and one of the reasons that I revived the organization and was so glad that. Ariella wanted to do this with me is because we are seeing this push sort of backwards and women only got the right to business credit in their own name in 1974, as I'm sure your mother remembers. Yes. Um, and, and while we have access to, to credit and capital, it continues to be a challenge. And what, what really brought this home to me was seeing how difficult it is or was, depending on what happens with the uh, PPP, the Paytech Protection uh, Program, how difficult it was for women-owned businesses to get that money and, and crippling for a lot of minority-owned businesses who 
who couldn't get a call back from their banks. So some of the behavior and, and challenges that existed 20 years ago with Count Me In have come roaring back in a way that is very disturbing, which is one of the reasons we created this grant program. While it's a drop in the bucket, considering the millions of small businesses who need access to this kind of, of, of funding, it, it suggests that we have to, again, redouble our efforts to remind people that women-owned businesses employ, what creates uh, over a trillion dollars and employ millions of people, as do minority-owned businesses. So there is a real uh, disconnect happening in terms of who needs the money coming from the federal government and how can other entities like, you know, a, a not-for-profit like Count Me In step in to, to help at least a, a, a small number of people as we sort of figure out how to adjust uh, the availability of, of federal or state funds to help small business. Well, prior to the pandemic, when the economy hit the brakes, uh, what was the level of, uh, female entrepreneurship, and what were the type of companies that women were creating? You know, there are such a range. When I started Take Our Daughters to Work Day, as an example, in the 1990s, women weren't in every sector. When I started Count Me In in 2000, you saw more and more women across all sectors. So I can't point and say there's one typical business that women start. I think they are in technology, they're in food, they're in um, personal care, they're in law, they're, they're in transportation, they're in everything now. I, I, I think the, 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 the bigger question is, is which businesses were hit hardest by the pandemic? And I think it's retail businesses, non-essential businesses, because where you see, I think, some extraordinary pivots were in the essential businesses that had to keep going like food, grocery, restaurants, you know, were able to stay open. And how did they adjust to the different rules and regulations and also the safety factors for their employees and their customers? How did they adjust and continue in some cases, not only to, to survive, but to grow based on how they handled the new situation? What kind of response did you get for the return of Count Me In? We had over, 3,000 requests for applications, and I'm looking at, they're still counting, but I think we had 400 people fill out the application. So it is a larger response to any of the competitions we held between 2000 and 2015. Uh, so I would say the need and the interest is great. Are you the only person who is doing this type of endeavor? Because I have to be honest, I'm not aware of any uh, other effort to really offer this kind of assistance to uh, women business owners in the manner that you're doing? Uh, the one organization, I've seen a couple of things. Ava DeVornier, the, the uh, film director, she did a similar size grant program for uh, young filmmakers. So she offered, uh, there was a quarter million dollars available, and I think she did that in April. Uh, so uh, she, she's done something extraordinary. I also saw that Sarah Blakely in April made five million available through an organization called Global Giving. And um, the, one of the uh, business organizations that I know, it's called WeBank and it's Women Business. I don't know what, what it all stands for, but they have been doing a pitch competition of which there is a grant attached for the winners. So I've seen a few things. Um, and, uh, and hopefully we will see more. Uh, Count Me In is, at, at this point, looking to raise another grant fund to make more money available in the fall. And hopefully more organizations will step up. I also noticed, I mean, things like Bank of America has set aside a billion dollars for communities of color, and in that billion is money for small businesses. We're investigating what that is to see if that's something that maybe we can partner with them on uh, to introduce them to some of the women that we know. Well, women of color have uh, really two obstacles going against them, both in terms of gender and race. What a percentage of entrepreneurship uh, is being created by women of color today? They are the fastest growing segment of, of, of small business development, both uh, black women and Latinas. 
Uh, they have been, I think, particularly hard hit in this um, recent round of disasters in that I, I, the last number I looked at was that something like 440,000 Black-owned businesses have already closed. That's correct. And the number is, I think it's 37% of Latin-owned businesses have closed. So within that, um, let's say 50, and in the Black-owned businesses, probably 60% of that number is female-owned. So there is real um, hardship. And I also see opportunity for people to come back into situations where they can redouble their efforts. And obviously, ooh, I, I don't want to say pandemic proof their businesses, but I think make different kinds of plans for how they reignite their businesses. The revival of the Black Lives uh, Matter movement in the aftermath of George Floyd's death uh, certainly shaken up the fabric of American society, and it's uh, causing us to take a, a very different look back into our past. But are we going to also be taking a progressive and proactive look into our future to ensure that going ahead, uh, women, people of color, uh, LGBT Americans, uh, people with disabilities, will have the equality and the social equity that has eluded many of them for too many years? I think we're at an extraordinary moment. I am extremely hopeful that that is exactly what's going to happen, that there is finally a recognition of the challenges that communities of color have had, particularly Black Americans have had, related to health, education, employment, opportunities, uh, access to credit and capital, uh, all of those issues are ones that at this moment, as we rebuild, can be addressed, I think, in a very progressive way. And it requires us sitting and listening, as opposed to talking, listening, and then members of the white community with our white privilege need to step up and fix these situations with them. I, I think it is not something we need to step aside and wait to see how, how they want to go. How do we move forward together as communities who have all had real challenges the past couple of months? Some people have had much greater challenges and we need to equalize not only the challenges, but equalize the opportunities for um, black women in particular and I think women of color across the board. Who do you see as a role model for today's uh, female business professionals? Well, I would certainly say, I would certainly say um, Ariella Eskenazi and Evora Russell, the head of uh, Curvy Couture, both of those companies, really demonstrate how successful business owners need to be paying it forward. They have done that through Count Me In, and they, they support many organizations. So I would say the two of them really stand out to me at the moment, but there are, are so many women business leaders who are, uh, as I mentioned before, Ava de Bournier is an extraordinary example of what everybody in Hollywood ought to be doing in terms of making grants and opportunities available for people in their professions to, to continue to move them along. Because the danger at a moment like this is that everybody goes backwards. And the people who are already too far behind fall off the ledge. And we need to reverse that so that they are seeing opportunity and able to seize opportunities to tell their stories, to make their products, to run their businesses in a way that includes the entire, entire makeup of our cities and, and towns and states. If I can ask you, Neil, who inspired you when you got started in business? I, I would say it was my parents more than anything. I know it's a, it's a cliched answer, but my parents were active in their community from the time I can remember. I went with them door to door registering voters long before you had postcard registration or any, obviously any online kind of voter registration. And I really learned a lot about how they valued the democracy that we do have and why they were constantly trying to expand the number of people 
who were voting. I distinctly remember a, a time when my father and mother went to the door of a household where the woman who answered spoke Italian and my father uh, spoke Italian. And he told me afterwards that what she was most afraid of was her boss knowing how she voted. Yeah. And my father had to explain to her that it was different here. And then of course she said something about, well, I let my husband do that. And luckily both my parents were there and they were able to explain how important it was that she, as well as her husband vote and, and all those things. And I watched that over and over again as a child in, in different ways. And I, they loved what they did. I, I, I loved watching them do it and couldn't have thought of a better way to lead my own life than being engaged in uh, activity that allows people to experience the same things that I've been able to experience in terms of creating my own business, starting a not-for-profit. I've recently been doing a lot of artwork. I mean, of, of truly being able to express myself in the way that my parents were able to express themselves. And that is my goal for everyone who, who interacts with Count Me In, is that they get to be and live the fullness of, of who they are and the potential that we all have. Now, if we were to have this conversation one year from today, where do you think the U.S. economy would be and where would women in business be in relation to the economy? I, I would say this. We have just witnessed something both very disruptive but also something extraordinary in, in who has stepped up in terms of leadership around the world. And what we've seen is amazing leadership from women leaders around the world in terms of dealing with the pandemic and how quickly they shut it down and how clear they were about their moral responsibility to their citizens. And I would say a year from now, more and more women are going to stand up like the mayor of Atlanta, like Nancy Pelosi. I mean, there are all kinds of political figures that are more obvious now because this is a government issue in terms of, of public health and all those things, as are as our, our, our equal rights and dealing with racism and, 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 and police brutality. They are the responsibilities of government, but they are the, also the responsibilities of business owners to step up and lead in how they treat their employees, who they hire, how they train employees, all of those issues. There is an opportunity for women to lead in a way that they never have before. And I would argue that a year from now, you and I would have, have, a, have a wonderful conversation about the growing number of women who are standing up and, and changing how they do business to include more people, as, as well as, I think, some real advances in public health. I mean, I just want to close talking about one of the women I know who applied, who is an ER doc in Los Angeles, who also has a master's in public health, very quickly saw the, 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 the inequality and discrimination regarding the black and brown people that were coming to her emergency room. And she turned it around and created a pop-up opportunity for communities around Los Angeles, Oakland, all kinds of places where people can go and get tested who don't have insurance or who are underinsured and learn more about how to protect themselves and their families it's absolutely extraordinary what one person has done in response to the pandemic and through a, a business that she set up that is providing this kind of service. And she's helping employers who operate in those communities get their employees tested as well as other community members. I mean, she covered so many bases, understanding the, the challenges that people have who don't have insurance, who, uh, all kinds of things. But that's one person, that's one woman. I mean, in my book, she should, you know, be heading the CDC in terms of how quickly and how, how creatively she created these pop-ups to help people stay healthy. And if they aren't healthy, get the services that they need without having to go to the hospital, which as we all know is the worst place to go these days, unless you absolutely have to go there. So, you know, my hat's off to her. Um, her name is Dr. Nana, uh, and I'll, I'll get to her full name, but Dr. Nana 
is uh, an extraordinary example of, of what people and women particularly can do when they see the challenge that say a woman comes in who has, who has COVID, what is she going to do about her children? How does she, how does she manage that? And it, this was, you know, what she saw that made her do something uh, different and creative to respond to the pandemic. Her business is called My COVID MD. Um, and it's, it's just one example of the things that I'm seeing that encourage me about what is going to be going on a year from now. Well, Nell, for the viewers who can't wait a year from now, if they want to get in touch with you and count me in, where can they find you? Uh, at uh, countmeinrevival.org. Excellent. Uh, we are there. We are very active. We, we literally, we have this whole team of people reviewing applications. We have a live Zoom event July 31st to announce the winners of this competition. You all are invited. You go to the website. You can click on, because if you want to feel encouraged and want to feel hope and see who the leaders are in communities across the country in terms of business owners, join us on, on July 31st. Nell Merlino, thank you so much for being a guest on today's episode. It's been very enlightening and very invigorating. It's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. And folks, we'll see you next week. Take care.